Good evening, everybody. My name is Edward Aspinall. I'm the um, head of the Department of Political and Social Change uh, in the School of International Political and Strategic Studies in the College uh, of Asia and the Pacific. And uh, the Department of Political and Social Change and the College of Law are co-hosting uh, this event this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Datu Ambiga Srinivasan, has a distinguished career in the law in Malaysia, including uh, as serving as president of the Malaysian Bar Council from 2007 to 2009. Uh, she's won many honours and awards, including an honorary doctorate of law uh, from the University of Exeter, an International Women of Courage Award uh, from the United States Secretary of State in 2009, and many other honours uh, besides. But she addresses us tonight in her capacity as Chairperson of Bursi, uh, the Coalition for Free and Fair Elections in Malaysia, a civil society organisation or alliance of civil society uh, organisations that organised the enormous and enormously important rally uh, for free elections in Malaysia last July. Uh, and she addresses us tonight about her organisation, uh, its demands, the prospects for electoral reform and for free and fair elections in Malaysia. And she does so, of course, at a time, uh, at a momentous period uh, in Malaysian politics. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I welcome Thank you very much. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. There is, uh, as I've said before, there is a new greeting in Malaysia, and it is Salam Bursi. Not everyone uses it, but uh, <laughs> Salam Bursi. Salam Sajatra. Ladies and gentlemen, the question really is if you have, if you sit on the Human Rights Council and you have elections every five years and you have a written constitution, does it follow that you have a democracy? And unfortunately, the answer to that is no. As far as Malaysia's membership of the Human Rights Council is concerned, uh, we actually made certain pledges when we applied to in, in uh, 2010 to sit on the Human Rights Council. However, the, in, in a report in 2010, it is a, this is a Swaram report, which is an organization that has been since 1998, coming out with a human rights report on Malaysia. Uh, in that report, for the year 2010, this was their conclusion about the human rights record in Malaysia. And I quote, the Malaysian government is directly responsible for a worsened human rights situation in 2010. Three women were caned under Sharia law for the first time in Malaysian history. Arrests under the Internal Security Act doubled and the scope of arbitrary detention broadened. The spike in deaths by police shooting reached alarming levels, as some point to an unwritten shoot-to-kill policy, where police shoot first and claim self-defense later. Other cases expose violence and torture by police, with some raising questions of point-blank executions. While excessive police force against protesters is nothing new, 2010, saw water cannons and tear gas turned on peaceful protesters, including children. So that is a pretty severe indictment of our human rights record for the year 2010. For the year 2011, you only need to look at the manner in which the Bursay rally was handled by the government. Now, I assume all of you know what the Bursay rally is about. Um, it is about the citizens, a citizens, it's a citizens' movement for electoral reform, 
We had in the year 2007 such a movement which was formed by political parties, essentially the opposition, as well as several NGOs, and they organized a rally in the year 2007, which also saw about 50,000 people, and they too were asking for electoral reform. In fact, it was the first time that there was such a large movement for electoral reform, which is not to say that people were not asking for electoral reform, but it was not a hot topic, as it were, until 2007. Then we had the elections in 2008, and the elections in 2008 saw huge gains for the opposition. Uh, in fact, they won in five states, and they won many more seats than they had ever done before. And in fact, they managed to deprive the uh, party in power of their two-thirds majority. Now, the magic figure of two-thirds is, uh, it, it's important, it was important for the government because it allows uh, the party in power to amend the constitution. So it gives them almost absolute power in relation to the federal constitution, as well as, of course, all the laws that are passed in parliament. So that was a turning point, the year 2008. Since then, uh, many of the opposition members who actually moved the rally in 2007 went into government. The movement uh, went into uh, basically uh, uh, nothing happened, nothing moved as far as the movement for free and fair elections was concerned. And uh, I was approached sometime in 2010 and asked to head this movement. We then decided that we would uh, re-engineer Bursay into Bursay 2.0 version 2 and it would be a movement entirely consisting of civil society. So that's how Bursay 2.0 came into being. Now we actually had discussions etc with the election commission. We had one major discussion, we had memoranda that we handed, we had several other seminars etc where we talked about electoral reform. Now basically we then waited to see what happened in the Sarawak elections in April this year. Sarawak had its state elections and unfortunately we saw some of the worst uh, electoral examples of electoral fraud committed during the Sarawak elections. We then decided to hold the rally and we named the 9th of July as the date when we were going to do that. Now we then set up eight demands and I want to run through that very very quickly. The first demand was to clean the electoral roll. We had always maintained that there were many issues relating to the electoral roll. Uh, we, there were issues in relation to dead voters still remaining on the register. There were issues relating to phantom voters. There were issues relating to multiple voters. So we said the electoral roll has to be cleaned up. And as it turned out, after the rally, Many, many examples of uh, mistakes in the electoral roll were disclosed by the public. So in a sense, the Rakyat took over the role of Brazil, and almost on a daily basis, we had reports in the press, uh, in the online press, which showed that there were errors on the electoral roll, and in fact, the election commission started taking steps to clean up. Whereas before Brazil 2.0, they swore that there was nothing wrong with the electoral roll, and that they were going to do nothing. So that was one issue. We also asked for a reform of the postal ballot system, which, is, which includes absentee vote, voting for overseas uh, candidates. Now, I'm happy to announce that um, a case has been filed in relation to the rights of overseas voters to register uh, as absentee voters so that they can vote. And I think many Malaysians here will be happy to hear that. There are only certain categories who are now allowed to vote as absentee voters. A suit has been filed. There's a hearing date on the 14th of November, and we hope that we get a, a fair result in relation to that. So that's postal uh, balloting. Then we've asked for indelible ink. Now, indelible ink is important as far as we're concerned. It is really another level of protection. And in 2008, before the 2008 elections, in fact, the Election Commission 
had decided to use indelible ink. Unfortunately, a few days before polling, the cabinet decided that they were going to uh, disallow the use of indelible ink, citing uh, the reason that there was some kind of fraud going on and that they had uh, come across uh, someone or had heard news that someone was buying a huge amount of ink across the border and they were going to bring it in and there was going to be a huge amount of cheating because of indelible ink. Of course, till today, no one has been charged for any offence of cheating in relation to the indelible ink. So we don't know whether that was just an excuse. Clearly, they were spooked by the use of indelible ink because indelible ink actually stops um, phantom voters and stops multiple voting. That's really the, the uh, uh, reason why we suggested indelible ink. The other reason why we suggested indelible ink is because it is an inexpensive way of reducing fraud. Now, we are still pushing for this, and I think uh, this is something that may well be considered, I don't know, uh, but that is certainly one of the demands that we're pushing for. Then, of course, we have the demand on campaign period. At the moment, the campaign period has to be a minimum of seven days. We have asked for a minimum of 14 or 21 days. Actually, we've asked for 21 days. Now, at the moment, what the Election Commission does is they allow a period of seven, eight, and in fact, in the Srawa elections, it was 10 days. And recently, there has been nothing more than that, or nothing much more than that. Now, that is wholly inadequate. And it is certainly wholly inadequate if we are going to have overseas voting as well. And that is something that the Election Commission can actually decide and they can actually uh, implement that immediately. There is no need for us to go through the Parliamentary Select Committee before the, uh, they actually enforce or they implement the 21-day campaign period. Then, of course, we have the issue of free and fair access to media. Now, the media, unfortunately, in Malaysia, and this is not just during elections, at any point in time, there is a huge difference between the uh, mainstream press and the online media. The mainstream press is, of course, uh, absolutely skewed towards their owners, those in government, and uh, the news that comes out from them is, has been hardly impartial. Uh, as far as the online me uh, media is concerned, kudos to them, they have actually uh, managed to uh, 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 give a more balanced view of the news in the country. Now, we have, there is a serious problem with the mainstream media, and I think that they are suffering in their lead readership as a result of that, because more and more Malaysians are becoming totally disenchanted with the news that they're churning out. And, uh, well, we hope that ultimately, with the lack of readership or, or with the, uh, you know, the numbers falling, that they may actually learn a lesson and, uh, uh, and change. Unfortunately, it's not the journalists, you don't blame the journalists, they probably write the stories as they see them, but it is the editors uh, who have a policy. For example, in relation to Bursi, they were told, apparently, that they were to constantly refer to us as an illegal gathering. They were also told to demonize Per se. Basically, don't say anything nice about us. And of course, they followed orders. They did a very good job, actually, for, for the government. Now, strengthening of public institutions is the other thing we have asked for. That, of course, relates to the Election Commission itself, which has a serious problem as to its uh, independence. Uh, the public don't view, them, uh, don't view the uh, Election Commission as independent. Then, of course, you have the other institutions, like the police, the uh, anti-corruption agency, the MACC, and the judiciary. There really needs to be a strengthening of all the institutions if we are going to make sure that we have free and fair elections. Then, of course, our seventh demand is about corruption. We have seen various instances in Sarawak of corrupt practices, out and out vote buying, out and out intimidation, and we have asked for all these practices to stop. And if they do take place, we have asked for enforcement, strict enforcement of our laws. We actually have an act called the Election Offences Act that uh, criminalizes or, or rather makes uh, illegal 
um, bribery and treating and so on during uh, election period. But so far, there has been no one who has been charged under those acts. And unfortunately, where we are concerned, we see blatant acts of vote buying. Uh, and uh, no one appears to be punished as a result of this. Now, finally, we ask, our demand is in relation to dirty politics. What we've said is, stop dirty politics. Recently, we have had uh, case after case, because this is, it, it's not easy to be the opposition in Malaysia, let me tell you. And the reason for that is, Malaysia has, it is not used to having a strong opposition. And I think it's taking the government a little bit of getting used to, or a lot of getting used to. They can't seem to grasp the idea that an opposition, a strong opposition, is actually good for the country. They see them as the enemy. Um, in my view, when they do that, what they are doing is they are showing no respect for the people who have voted these members of parliament in. And unfortunately, that is the situation. So what they do with the opposition is they throw everything at them. They keep them busy by attacking them personally. Uh, they use dirty politics. They use sex videos and, and, and other such uh, awful attacks. Things that actually the ordinary Malaysian and the right-thinking Malaysian are truly fed up with. So we really are not interested in that kind of politics. What we want to hear are debates, healthy debates, about policies. We want to know what the candidates have to offer to the rakyat who are going to vote for them. So all in all, that, those are the eight demands. And these are just immediate demands. You, you will notice that I haven't talked about long-term demands. And the reason for that is these demands are the demands that we expect to be met before the next general elections. In other words, before the 13th general elections. Uh, one of the ways, in fact, in which they can clean up the electoral roll is by introducing automatic voter registration. Automatic voter registration is something that is easy to implement in Malaysia because we have the identity card system. So all in all, all the demands that we've asked for, and the reason I went through them very briefly is for you to appreciate that they are not difficult to implement, that really it doesn't take long to implement. And yet, the government refuses to give us an assurance that these eight demands will all be implemented before the 13th general elections. And that's actually rather disappointing. Because what the government has done, which is commendable, is they have set up, and this is after the Bursi rally, if you want to know what the effect of the Bursi rally was, after the Bursi rally, the government set up a parliamentary select committee on electoral reform. Now, we were delighted with that. That is actually historical. That's the first time it has ever happened in Malaysia. So that was a good thing. And so we got, we were excited and we thought, fine, obviously, it must mean that they're going to look at reform before the 13th general elections. But when they were asked the question, are you going to bring in these reforms before the next general elections? They said, there's no guarantee of that. We cannot give the assurance because we cannot take away the prime minister's right to decide what is the best time to call for elections. Now that, to me, is extremely disappointing. You may as well not have set up the uh, PSC because these reforms that we've asked for can be done within a period of six months and can be done before the calling of the next general elections. And it is a shame because this was one way in which they could have shown political will to actually bring about change in relation to the general elections. But unfortunately, it appears as if they're not prepared to give us the assurance. But nevertheless, we will work through the issues with the Parliamentary Select Committee and see how far we go. And this is why uh, Bursay launched a second campaign called Clean Before 13. And what that means is we want these demands to be met before the 13th general election. So the pressure that we need to keep putting on the government is in relation to that. And we will continue to do so. Now, what did the government uh, how did the government view Bursay 2.0? Well, let me tell you. 
For starters, we had, uh, and, and this is the six weeks leading up, after we made the announcement, leading up to the 9th of July, we had the ministers coming out, uh, and each of them slamming per se, uh, saying that we were there to topple the government. Uh, that's certainly the view of the Minister of Home Affairs, even as recently as uh, three, three or so weeks ago, that really Bursay is there to topple the government. Um, then we had uh, ministers saying that we don't like street protests, uh, this is not the Malaysian way, uh, you know, etc., etc. It will cause chaos. We had uh, members of the public, so called members of the public, coming forward. There were more than 2,000 police reports lodged against per se. And the government came out and said, you see, 2,000, more than 2,000 police reports against per se, the public, the silent majority, they said, don't like what per se is doing. So they used the police reports to attack per se as well. Then they used the mainstream press, of course, who obediently did the bidding of the government and um, helped in demonizing us on a daily basis. Uh, they threw charges of uh, communism at us. They said we were foreign funded, that uh, we had the backing of the Jews and the Christians. And I mean, they just, everything, everything they could think of, they threw at us. And that was the mainstream press. And it didn't matter that they misled on the facts. It didn't matter that they got so many of the facts from. It didn't matter because the idea was to make us out to be a terrible group of people. And that's what they did on a daily basis and on the television channels um, and uh, the things they were saying, they, they, they did little, uh, little um, adverts as it were, you know, saying why people shouldn't go for the Bursay rally and so, can you imagine the money that they spent, apparently they spent more than 10 million, both on the, uh, on the police, uh, uh, on the police who were brought out on the day as well as obviously all these things that they did. Now, so this is what they were doing on a daily basis. Actually, we were shocked. We were utterly shocked because by all accounts, um, free and fair elections is actually a boring subject, right? To many people, it is utterly boring. But thanks to the government, they made it the most interesting subject for the six weeks leading up to July the 9th rally. And in the last week, they ratcheted up the, uh, the pressure on the organizers, on the people, and they were scaring the people. They didn't want people to turn up. So what they did was, um, I mean, they, they, I can tell you, we were followed, I was followed, our phones were tapped, I mean, we even received uh, death threats. And what they did, uh, the, the government did was, they then pronounced per se illegal, they said, your illegal organization, this is what the minister said. And the, one of the reasons why they said we were illegal is because they said you're planning to overthrow the government. Uh, then they threatened to use the ISA on all of us. The uh, IGP came out saying that uh, in the press that T-shirts, shoes, cars, buses, if used to encourage people to gather is seditious, he said, and people would be arrested. And in fact, people were arrested for wearing yellow. I mean, that looked, that was ridiculous. But it happened. It happened. And uh, the IGP also said, based on their intelligence, and this is always what we were told, even when we had meetings with the police, they kept telling us, you don't know what we know. We have evidence that if the rally is held, there will be tension, chaos, destruction of property, injury, uh, and even loss of life may occur. And I'm quoting actually from uh, reports of what the IGP said. Now, they also then arrested six people under the emergency ordinance which is detention without trial. These six people, one of whom was a member of parliament, Dr. Jay Kumar, they were arrested, they belonged to the Party of Socialist Malaysia, and they were arrested prior to the 9th of July, uh, very much prior to the 9th of July, and they were held under pro the provisions for detention without trial. And they were held in solitary confinement. And they were held long after the July the 9th rally was over. So they were held for almost 30 days in solitary confinement and initially the charge was, wait for it, waging war against the king, okay? Uh, yes, uh, we had to look that one up because, you know, but it's somewhere there. Uh, waging war against the king. Then after that, they said, okay, you are now carrying subversive, you, you, we are charging you for carrying subversive material. 
And that subversive material were the eight demands. You know what I just read out to you? By the way, it's subversive in Malaysia, potentially. So they kept changing their minds about what the charges were. They couldn't figure it out. But the reason why, and I, we, were, we knew what the reason why they did this. They did this because they wanted to frighten the rest of us. Look, this is what we can do to you if you carry on with the rally. And I feel terrible that six people, decent human beings, who really, uh, if you know Dr. Michael Jayakumar, I can tell you that man has done so much for the poor, has done so much to uplift the, the lives of so many people, and he's well adored in his constituency, that the fact that these people had to be under solitary confinement because the government was trying to scare everybody else is truly a tragedy. And I will still maintain, and I have been maintaining, and I think everyone feels that these six people deserve an apology and compensation from the government for the manner in which they were treated. Now, recently, the charges against Dr. Michael Jayakumar and the five others were effectively dropped. So they got, I, I just read this when I, uh, a few days ago, their charges, uh, they've been acquitted, not amounting to a discharge. See, they can't give you a complete acquittal uh, because then it means they're admitting they were completely wrong. So it is a discharge not amounting to an acquittal. But what shocking behavior, what shocking behavior for a country that sits on the Human Rights Council, depriving one who is a member of parliament and all the others of their liberty, without bothering, uh, depriving them of their liberty for 30 days. And the reason they were released was because it was coming to the end of the initial detention period. And I believe it's also because Dr. Uh, Michael Jayakumar was, was so fed up. He threatened to go and he did start a hunger fast. But kudos to the Malaysian people. On a daily basis, they held candlelight vigils uh, outside Bukit Aman and all over uh, Kuala Lumpur until these people were released. So again, I say well done and congratulations because it was people power that ultimately resulted in their release. Now, of course, they also then, in the days leading up to the 9th of July, they got ex parte orders. They got ex parte orders where we were not heard, stopping us, uh, myself and a few other people they saw as leaders, from going into the center of town. They didn't want us anywhere near the stadium where we were supposed to meet. So they got ex parte orders. And uh, then, of course, uh, on the 6th of July, the prime minister was seen um, endorsing Silat groups. You know what Silat, uh, the um, martial arts groups. And they came out with a statement saying that they would wage war on Versailles and that they could not control their members' emotions if they were opposed. So that was another scare tactic. There were other scare tactics. They had the army coming up uh, in a, you know, uh, and uh, carrying out exercises, as it were, uh, basically saying, if you do not disperse, we will shoot, that kind of thing, all right? So that was another scare tactic. So all this was happening in the lead up to the 9th of July. So, on the 9th of July, of course, much to the shock of the uh, authorities, the numbers that turned up, numbering 50,000 Malaysians, uh, was staggering. The roads were blocked. In fact, it was like a war zone. They had blocked everyone, everyone's path into the city center. And yet, the Malaysians were so incensed uh, who were so incensed by the manner in which the government had behaved, turned up in full force on that day. And they overcame the intimidation and the fear that had been leveled against them by the authorities. And really, shabas to the people of Malaysia who turned up on the streets that day. Um, I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> lose one of our supporters, Alayarham Bahuruddin, very sad, uh, because it was a wholly avoidable death. What happened was, he was tear gas was shot at him, uh, he then had breathing difficulties, but unfortunately, uh, 
the police and or the uh, those in authority around him did not assist in getting an ambulance to him quickly or in rushing him to hospital. So we believe that it was a wholly avoidable death and that to us is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Now, so we had the government saying that we were the most evil organization that existed. Now let me tell you what the people said. And let's see whether there is a disconnect between the two. I have one story here called Facing Danger. This is from Gursay Stories. I don't know if you've seen this book. But it is a book which contains all the uh, stories of the Bursi supporters who were out on that day. There's one here that says, we shared a few hours. We didn't even know one another's names, but that was enough. In those hours, we had lived life to the fullest. We asked ourselves what we could do to help ourselves and acted. At 58, I will not run away a run anymore and I must turn to confront my destiny. What a day. That was one of the supporters who was there. And here we have another one where he says, Merdeka when I was six, true democracy at 60. So some, a 60 year old and he says at the end, on the verge of turning 60, my prayer is that this beloved land of my birth has come of age. That's how he felt. And Many, many, many more stories, Bursay stories, where people just were so moved by what happened on the 9th of July. They felt that for the first time, they were Malaysians. They were all one. That's how they felt. They felt that they had overcome the barriers of fear, uh, the barriers of race, the barriers of religion. There were no, they, there were no barriers, in fact. And everyone there helped each other. And what they showed was that despite all the intimidation, Malaysians, when push comes to shove, when you overdo it, when you intimidate to the extent that you did, they will come up in full force to oppose it. And that's what happened on that day. Now, now what? The question is, after the 9th of July, what now? And the answer is this. And here I want to talk about global Brussels. I have been, um, I've been to, to London. I have met the global Brussels people in London. I have met them in Australia, in Melbourne, Sydney, now in Canberra. And I am so moved by the manner in which global Brussels has developed. Now, global Brussels is really important. This is the Malaysian diaspora. We very often complain about the brain drain in Malaysia. We are very sad that we have lost tremendous talent. And, but this global Brussels has actually brought all this talent together. It may be on the global stage, it doesn't matter. But these are Malaysians who still care about what happens in Malaysia. And I think it is a wonderful movement. And not only are they connecting with each other, they are also doing so much. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that everywhere our ministers go, including the Prime Minister, Bursi will be there to greet them. As has happened in Shogun, in Perth, Bursi was there to greet them. And this is the wonderful thing about Bursi that I feel the government does not appreciate. You can see the demonizing that the government did, but you can see how the people really feel about Bursi. Look at the disconnect. And I can tell you the number of youth that I have met who love what Bursi stands for because we are apolitical. We are not aligned to any political party. What we stand for is what is right. We want transparency. We want a better Malaysia. And we are prepared to now stand up and ask for it. And really what we're saying by Bursi and through Bursi is that we really are fed up at the way the politics is run in our country at the moment. 
We don't like the dirty politics. We're sick of it. We don't like the language of racism. We don't like people running down others because of their religion and their race. We want a different level of discourse. We want a more mature level of discourse. We want to see statesmanship. In my view, no statesmanship was shown over the period running up to Bursi. No one was a statesman. No one came out and was prepared to be the voice of reason. However, there were some people who are perhaps more junior in the government who did come up and make sense. So I, when I'm asked this question, do you have hope for Malaysia? My answer is absolutely. And what's given me hope is Bursi, actually, and the effect Bursi has had on people. And the fact that Bursi is such a unifying factor because it is built on something that is good. It is built on something that is honest. It is built on issues that relate to a transparent and accountable government. And to me, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is a powerful movement. I actually think that we are going to get the diaspora to come home. The talent may well come back, because now you may work from afar, but you are working to build a better Malaysia. And I say congratulations to the diaspora, and may you grow bigger and bigger. And I know the numbers are out there. May you grow bigger and bigger, and may you continue to feel a part of the Malaysia that we love, because ultimately, Bursay happened because we love Malaysia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ambika, for that um, wonderfully clear and compelling exposition. We now have a little over 45 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I just ask you to uh, briefly introduce yourself uh, when you ask a question or make a comment and uh, because our time is limited, if you do make a comment please keep it a little limited. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take a list um, but please just indicate if you'd like to ask a question or perhaps I can even just let you manage the yeah, I, I, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Please, go ahead. It's good to ask questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead. announced that they would be repealing the uh, Internal Security Act and other oppressive legislation. But they, they're going to replace it with two acts. We really need to see what those two acts say. We need to know how far they will go. But for me, what is key is two things. One is we need to have a government who doesn't abuse its powers. You may have all the legislation that you have, but if the government decides, for example, the ISA, when it came into being, uh, in the 60s, it was meant to be used for a specific purpose, and that it was stated in Parliament. If you read Hansen's, you, you can see that. It was there for a specific purpose, to deal with communists at that time. But as time went on, it was used to stifle opposition. It was used to stifle dissent. So at the end of the day, you, we need to be able to trust the government that they will not abuse any of the powers that they have regardless of what the legislation is. Now, that is one point. 
But the more important point is what you said about the court ruling. Ultimately, if there is any abuse of power, it happens. It happens in the best of countries, let me assure you, okay? It happens everywhere. But if the judiciary stands between the citizen and that abuse, then you have hope. Because the judiciary is the only one who can tell the, uh, those who hold power, sorry, you've gone outside the act, or you have gone too far, or you're infringing this individual's right, and you can't do that. If we have a dynamic, independent judiciary, which is why one of the things we have asked for is a strengthening of the institutions, if we have that, then really there should be little worry that we are not protected against abuse. So it is a wonderful decision, the court. I'm happy to see that. But I'd like to see what happens as that matter goes up on appeal and further up. But this is the point that I make. In Australia, the so-called, the infamous Malaysia solution, uh, what did the High Court of Australia do? They said, sorry, you can't do this because Malaysia is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention. So you cannot do this swap and you cannot send these refugees over to Malaysia. So despite what the government had decided, the courts looked at it from a legal perspective, looked at the conventions, looked at the human rights issues and said, sorry, you can't do that. So what you need is a judiciary, independent judiciary, who is prepared to tell those in power, sorry, you cannot cross the line. And to me, actually, that is key, independent judiciary. Because um, the Election Commission was used to doing things in the same way for the longest time, uh, they just carried on. Now their view, my, my own view is they're not independent. Uh, and I think that's the view of many Malaysians. They are, uh, uh, the, uh, those who have been appointed to the Election Commission are all ex-civil servants. So if they obey the government, it really is something they're used to doing. So, and I do believe they do do the bidding of the government. Uh, although they say they see the opposition as well, ultimately I think that, that they lack that independence. And in fact, under the federal constitution, the, the Young Putuan Organ is supposed to appoint members to the commission who enjoy public confidence. Those words are there in the federal constitution. But unfortunately, I don't think that they see their role as being totally independent of the government of the day. Uh, when we keep asking them questions, they say, oh, we had made suggestions to the government, but the government doesn't want to bring about the changes. And uh, when they say that, I say, well, then let us know. What are those amendments to the reform law, to, to the electoral laws, uh, uh, electoral laws that you want to make? And we, civil society, will support you if it is right. But they say, oh, no, Official Secrets Act. We can't tell you, all right? So, you know, they get tied up in all these knots. So ultimately, the other thing we ask them is, look, why aren't you enforcing the Election Offences Act? And then they say, no, we don't have prosecutorial powers, which is true. But, we say, 
Under the Act, you are supposed to set up enforcement teams who are supposed to look at compliance of the laws. If there is non-compliance, make a police report. That's the least you should do. They don't listen. They don't think, so in fact, nothing is enforced under the Election Offences Act. I don't know why we have the Election Offences Act. So every time you push them, you say, look, you know, what, as I said, I said uh, earlier, someone in the audience, when I had a debate with the Election Commissioner, uh, Deputy Election Commissioner, stood up and said, are you an event, event management committee or are you the Election Commission? Because really, they kept saying, they kept repeating, all we do is manage elections. All we do is manage elections. So really, to, they need to be empowered, you're right. They absolutely need to be empowered. They need to appreciate how much power they actually have. Unfortunately, they don't. And let me tell you, you cannot remove a, an election commissioner unless it's on the same grounds as you could remove a federal court judge. That's how important they are. And we keep telling them this. And we've actually said to their face, actually, people don't think you're independent enough. But unfortunately, um, my own view is that it's perhaps best not to appoint former civil servants to this position. It's really got to be someone who's strong enough to stand up to the government and who is just there to serve the citizens, ultimately, and nothing else. So I'm afraid the answer to your question, do they realize uh, what their role is, I don't think so. I don't think they fully appreciate how much power they actually have, because they don't ex exercise it. Yes, John. I'm John, and I'm a friend and a Malaysian at heart. Now, you mentioned about fear and intimidation. That seems to be the SOP of the Malaysian government to keep its citizens, citizens in check. I have many Malaysian friends who even have PR here that are still afraid. In the context of the Versailles um, rally, and the fact that, you know, I think the last census there's about over 100,000 Malaysians, I'm talking Malaysian citizens, living in Australia, and there were, you know, limited numbers of people attending the Grisset rally. What is your advice to these people so that we can actually have three times, four times the numbers at the next rally? Thank you very much, John. Um, okay, overcoming fear, that's, that's, that's key. Frankly, and I think uh, what happened on the 9th of July is many Malaysians on the ground overcoming their fear. Um, I can understand why people still fear uh, uh, reprisal because uh, they, they, everyone keeps talking about the special branch. They may well be here, but they, they all know what I say anyway. So. <laughs> I'm a lost cause <laughs> as far as they're concerned. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and they, they, this fear, they do perpetuate this fear. But really, I think what you need to see, because what the 9th of July showed was, you're not the only ones who felt that way. A lot of people felt, am I the only one who feels strongly? 9th of July showed that thousands of people feel the way you do. Thousands of people don't like what's happening. And to me, it is safety in numbers. If, if you make a stand, if you make a stand, look at the diaspora. It's not one person from a jurisdiction, it's many. And as long as those numbers keep growing, if there is safety in numbers. If anything happens to any one of us, uh, I can tell you there will be a backlash. There will be, because Bursay has become that type of a family. If anything happens to anyone, publicize it immediately. If you feel intimidated, publicize it immediately. And I can tell you, that's what I do. I, uh, when I, what I say, I say the same thing in Malaysia, I say the same thing in Sydney, I say the same thing here, I say the same thing everywhere, I don't hide anything. It's all out there. If anybody wants to argue their case with me, you want to oppose what I say, no problem, please do so. So there is nothing I say that is different. I don't speak one way to one audience, another way to another. So to me the key is, don't be afraid. I know my phone was tapped, but I still talk over the phone and I still speak my mind. I don't say anything different. And I think that's what you should do. Don't change the way you behave. Don't change the way you think. If that's how you feel safe. As long as you can back it up, as long as you're prepared to uh, face an argument in respect to that, I think that's the best way to go. And of course, ultimately, uh, it's a question of 
your motives, you see. If you're clear in your mind that this is a good thing for Malaysia, then really there is nothing to fear. Because you will find that you are definitely not alone. Not in this battle. Not anymore. I'm sure you're all convinced of that now, right? So don't be afraid. <laughs> So Ambika, you said you're, uh, you, you, you're aware your phone is tapped, but you might, might not have been aware that this uh, talk tonight is being live streamed on the internet. <laughs> yes. and, um, a question has come in from one of our yes. online viewers, and that question is, what is your opinion of shadow cabinets? Uh, no, I think that, you know, uh, recently we've had the shadow budget, as it were, uh, which was done by the Pakatan, a real one. I mean, previously they've done it before, but I think this time they really put a lot of effort into it. It is a very good idea. Shadow cabinets is a very good idea because it's like an understudy. Because in a system where you think you're going to have multi-party democracy and that you think there's going to be a change at any point in time, that's the whole point, then, of course, the government who is coming into power has to be ready to take on these positions. So shadow cabinet is critical. It also means that you are actually calling to account those in those uh, those ministers in those particular positions. So I personally think shadow cabinet is a very good idea. Uh, I was very happy to see the budget that was done by the opposition. Of course, it got flack and there was people discussing it. No problem with that. But it was such an important thing for them to have done because it is also a way in which people can judge the opposition, uh, the policies of the opposition. And that's why, to me, those things are more important than whether, you know, uh, these silly videos that keep floating around and keep appearing. So those are the things that are important to me because I really want to know whether you can run this country. I think that's all we want to know, right? Because we want to know that those people who are going to come into power, are they going to run this country properly? We also want to know, and let me tell you, because I'm a member of many women's groups, we also want to know whether some of these MPs are sexist. We're very keen on it because I can tell you, the women's movements will move for voting against sexist MPs. And I can tell you, you will be hor uh, you'll be horrified at the comments of uh, sexist comments made by some of the MPs in Parliament. So I think we should have a heightened awareness about that. I think we should have a heightened awareness about green issues. For example, the Linus issue and other green issues. If an MP doesn't support a green agenda, you should vote against an MP. That's the kind of thing that we want to see happening. We really want to pin these candidates down, both sides, okay, opposition as well as government. And we want to know, we need to know whether these people deserve to have our vote. Yes? Regarding your demand for free and fair access to media that you've talked a bit about, I wonder if you could give a bit of an outline as to the likely scenario of, of the immediate future of this and is it going to come from the industry itself or is the government likely to repeal some of these press laws? And also, on the same topic, do you think that all the other demands that you're making can be made if, worst case scenario, there isn't any improvement for greater press freedom or improvement in the mainstream media at the moment? Yes, you're absolutely right. I think uh, free press is key because they can really make a difference, just like actually the online media has made a difference. Uh, but unfortunately, the laws in relation to the press are still there. Recently, the government announced um, an amendment to the Printing Presses and Publications Act, and what they said was, instead of the, pre uh, the publication having to apply for a yearly license, they will now give a license. They, you, you only need to make one application, they will give a license, but they can revoke it at any time. So there's no difference to me, all right? Because you can revoke it in too much. So really, that control of the press, they can't seem to give it up. And I think they have to. That's where the problem lies. So I do think that there's going to be a problem in relation to the media. And it's not, that's not the only legislation. We have the Sedition Act. We have the um, Official Secrets Act. We, these are all repressive legislation that doesn't allow for free flow of information. And we also have the Multimedia Act, because now they're also trying to uh, curtail um, the internet to some extent. Because what they do is they issue show cause letters. There are show cause letters flying all over the place against publications who publish things that 
uh, are, are really uh, against the government or anti-government. So this, this is a problem that we have, and I agree with you that a free press is absolutely critical. The other demands are important, are very important. In fact, the electoral role, to me, we can't go to the polls with the electoral role in the state that it is. But you see, if we need to pressure for change, the press is critical. And actually, kudos to the online media, they have played their part. They have played their part, and they have been much more object objective, and I think they have made the difference. But really, what has really made the difference is social media. I know everyone says this. Uh, this it, it has changed the landscape. Bursi really is a movement that was sandwiched between other movements. You saw the, well, you saw the Arab Spring. We are nowhere near the Arab Spring. We are nothing about overthrowing government. And then you saw the movement in India, Anahar Hazari's anti-corruption movement. Now you see Occupy Wall Street. So this people power through social media is a phenomenon that governments are really going to have to learn to deal with. So the press really has to keep up. The mainstream press has to keep up with what is happening out there, or they're going to lose the plot completely. So I think we would like to see greater freedom for the press, without a doubt. And I agree with you. I think it is a critical com component for a free and fair election. government, uh, the political parties uh, in the government, we invited opposition parties, we invited NGOs. So we invited everybody actually, basically. And of course, there's no surprise that the opposition would support us. No surprise at all, because they feel hard done by, by the present electoral system, which favours the government heavily. And I'm talking about uh, not just these eight demands that we're talking about, I'm talking about even the delineation process. You have constituencies, uh, smaller constituencies for the government, uh, uh, for those potential uh, government MPs, and you have very large constituencies for opposition MPs. So more people have to vote before you can get one opposition member into parliament, less people have to vote to get one into, uh, into the uh, uh, Barisan government. So, there is a problem. The, the, the dice, I mean, in, in a sense, it, it has always been uh, weighted in favour. Delineation has all, always been weighted in favour of the government in power. That's only one of the things. The press doesn't help. There is no level playing field because the press heavily favours the government. They do not report on what the opposition says. They do not report on opposition policies. That's another... So, and then we can go on and on in re relation to the other issues, the attacks that the opposition face, leaders face, in relation to personal lives and so on. That also goes on. So no surprise at all that they would support the electoral reforms that we're asking for, because they feel hard done by. Now, they are also um, citizens of Malaysia. They have every right to support this cause. But we made it clear that this was entirely civil society, we told them that they cannot march with their party flags or party t-shirts and they cannot, no party slogans. It was entirely a per se to a pair. And if you look at the people on the street on that day, you cannot say that that was an opposition rally. It was entirely a rally by the Rakyat of Malaysia. And let me tell you, when you read this book, the per se stories, these are the people who are there, who are not afraid to tell their stories. There's no political alignment. These were ordinary people. And I can tell you the number of middle class people who turned up, who were ne would never have turned up before, the number of middle class people who turned up, professionals who turned up, is quite a shift. Because in the old days, I can tell you, you won't find the, you find, of course, lawyers are always trouble because we always <laughs> But you won't find the doctors and you won't find the accountants, but they were all out there. And basically, you read these stories, they will say, we did it for our children. 
because we really want a better Malaysia. So ultimately, I think the proof lies in the pudding, which is look at the people who turned out on that day. You can't say that it was an opposition biased rally. It wasn't. It was entirely citizens of Malaysia gathering for a worthy cause. I'm, I'm just interested to get uh, your thoughts on uh, opinion polling. I mean, it obviously can be a curse to politics in um, a mature democracy like Australia, but in Malaysia, it might be very illuminating and useful to see what people really think when you strip out all the bias from the mainstream media. I mean, do you have, can you, are you able to give us a bit of information? I mean, is scientific opinion polling something that's done in Malaysia by impartial groups? Um, do you have any data on um, just how sympathetic the entire population is to groups like Hootsie and indeed who they want to vote for? Yes. Thanks. Well, uh, yes, we have recently, uh, we have uh, Marega Centre, which is one of the uh, centres that conducts these polls. And we've recently seen uh, polls being conducted. I mean, it, it's not, it was not a phenomenon that was present previously. Um, so we do get these opinion polls. And we have got polls in relation to Bursi, for example, that we have managed to reach out to perhaps more of an urban, uh, urban, uh, the urban uh, population, as opposed to the rural population. Uh, because a recent poll came out and said actually the rural population don't know anything about Bursi. Uh, those things are useful because we need to know what our reach is and we need to know who to reach out to. So now we know how to plan our program. So these things are useful. Of course, the sampling is important. Sometimes I don't think the samplings are big enough. Uh, you know, uh, doing just a sampling of 5,000 people or 2,000 may not be enough. But nevertheless, I think it is being used now, and I think there was even an opinion poll about the popularity of the Prime Minister and so on. Uh, again, the samplings are, may not be big enough, but it's some indication. I mean, I don't think you should rest your entire case on, on the opinion polls, but it's an indication as to the work you need to do and how you need to improve. So yes, we do. Um, we do have the Marika Centre. I don't know whether there are any other polls. I don't know whether any Malaysians here can help me. Uh, but Marika Centre is certainly one of them that we, that we use, or we rely on. Uh, is the strategy you were hopeful in relation to hearing those abuses essentially to try to work on the centre and hope that somehow it will clean up? Thank you very much for that question. I think uh, we we rely on the civil society movements in Sarawak and Sabah because the problems in Sabah and Sarawak are slightly different from those uh, that occur in West Malaysia. A different approach is required. Uh, and. Uh, but we are there, we help, and they're certainly uh, supportive of Bursi, and, and we have organizations who are uh, part of Bursi and who, whom we work with. So there's no doubt we're all on the same page, the activists there and, and us here. Uh, but we work more through the activists on the ground because the issues in Strava, for example, for ex the out and out fraud and vote buying that, that was actually ca captured on video in Strava really is pretty blatant. And the reason they can do that is because in Strava you have uh, far flung areas, you have long houses that don't even have uh, electricity or water, and um, who don't care really who's in power, but if you give them, you know, you can't blame them. Um, uh, we'll give them money and they will vote for you. That's 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 the way they have been uh, doing their business of uh, voting. So it's really different issues. There really requires to be special programs to raise the awareness of Sarawakians and Sabahans uh, in these far flung areas. And that's what the activists do. We actually have some very dedicated activists who go into the longhouses and who make who get people to register to vote, because many of them aren't even registered to vote. So there is a, a real concerted effort that's being carried out in Sabah Sarawak. We also have Radio Free Sarawak, which has been set up, which 
communicates through radio, through interviews and so on, with the people out there. Again, in a hope that we can raise their awareness in relation to the importance of elections. I think that's the problem, is really getting, it, getting the message out there that their votes are really valuable and they shouldn't give it away to anyone for any reason. And that they should really exercise it in their own interest so that their lives improve. That's the message we're trying to get across. Thanks. And the gentleman here. Hi, uh, I'm Sir Ivan Loss. I would like to see your legal opinion on the freedom of religion in Malaysia. Uh, we have our, in our constitution, Article 121, uh, 1A, which removes the jurisdiction of common law in uh, religious law. And this goes against sec, uh, Article 6, which guarantees the freedom of religion. How do you think it should be resolved in our turbulent political climate? Do you know how, what a complex question that is? <laughs> <laughs> I need about an hour to answer it, actually. <laughs> But uh, yes, I mean, there's no doubt that there's freedom of religion under our federal constitution, Article 11, actually, oh, uh, freedom of religion. And, uh, but of course, you have the one-to-one, -one, uh, 1A situation as well. Uh, there is an issue as to the jurisdictional divide between Sharia law and the civil courts. Now, it is for the courts to resolve that problem. But I don't personally think that the courts have resolved it satisfactorily. In the past, the judges were actually brave enough to take on these religious issues, uh, where, for example, one party converts and the spouse is left behind, there's a divorce. They generally resolve the issues relating to the children under the civil law. But as recently, the judges have shown a reluctance to deal with religious issues, particularly in a situation where you have this jurisdictional clash, because on the one hand, you have one spouse who is Muslim and therefore subject to the Sharia law. On the other hand, you have the other spouse who is not subject to the Sharia courts. So you have the Sharia courts making some orders, you have the civil courts making some orders. So there are issues in relation to that, which are not resolved. We recently, uh, in fact, the Attorney General's chambers, to their credit, a few, uh, two or three years ago, uh, sat down, sat with all the religious groups and tried to resolve these issues by way of legislation. And um, they actually came up with a final draft. The government was actually ready to move ahead with that piece of legislation. But unfortunately, it got stalled when it went before the rulers. And we never heard anything about it after that. So these vexed issues still continue to be a problem. And there is one case, in fact, um, where a Hindu woman with two children, the husband converted and unilaterally converted the two children, and uh, she's left the jurisdiction with the two children because she felt that she was not getting anywhere in the courts in Malaysia. So it's still a problem, I'm afraid, and there's still no resolution. So we're waiting for this legislation to come through. Thank you. And and I have two questions. Firstly, you mentioned strengthening public institutions. By strengthening, you mean cleansing and purging um, the institutions of all the, of the people who are destroying our system and betraying the people. Secondly, um, how do you think our next general election would be different from the past one? I think you answered your own question in the first. <laughs> 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 Purging the, yes, the system of people who are corrupt, yes, very good idea, yeah. very good idea. Uh, okay, one of the biggest problems in Malaysia, in my view, is corruption, okay? That is what has eaten away at our institutions. The other thing is that they are not independent. They don't see their role as serving the people, serving the interests of the people. They see their role as serving the interests of the government. So, yes, there has to be a cleaning, cleaning up, a bursekan. No? It has to be burse, everything has to be bursekan. So, there definitely has to be. Uh, and it is a process that has to start. And you see, there's no point, for example, having the MACC and having all these organizations and institutions when at the end of the day, really the people can tell that the, the prosecution, for example, is uh, you know is lopsided. They don't prosecute everyone. You know it's uh, uh, selective prosecution. So yes, the systems have to be cleaned up. There's no doubt about that. 
as far as all the institutions have to be cleaned up. Again, um, you know, you're looking at key institutions, and the way they do that is really by ensuring that people of highest integrity occupy positions of power in these institutions. That's that's key. Now, as far as the elections, the next election, general elections, whether I think it's going to be any different from the last one, well, we'll have to, I'm afraid we'll just have to wait and see, because it depends on whether any of our demands are put into effect. For example, if the government says there's nothing wrong with the elections system, and they have been saying that, they say they've set up the PSC even though our system is okay, all right? Fair enough. If you say the system is okay, get international observers. Prove it to us. Bring in the international observers and let them observe our elections. So that's my call to the Malaysian government. If you say your system is fine and that it doesn't need reform before the 13th general elections, I dare you, bring in international observers and let them make the decision as to whether our elections are free and fair. So do I expect changes? Well, you know, um, I do think because the public are so aware about electoral fraud now, which they never were before, because everyone is keeping their eyes and ears open, and you can see that when you look at the on online media, suddenly you get a, 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 a report, oh, we saw X, Y, Z happening, and I think it's you know because of this reason, and ICs, and so on and so forth. People are actually opening their eyes and ears, and maybe because everyone is so attuned to this, these issues, maybe it would be more difficult for electoral fraud to take place. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, so I, I would think that really what we should do, what we should do is, again, we should call for international observers no matter what, and we should actually come out in large numbers on election day and make sure that we push that percentage up because when you have large numbers, you can actually, uh, I won't say minimize fraud, you can mitigate it to some extent. Uh, because how many phantom voters can you have? Maybe they will prove us wrong, but how many phantom <laughs> voters can you have? So I would actually encourage everyone, your friends, you're here, I mean, I hope you get your postal vote. Are you registered, by the way? By the way, are you all registered to vote? Malaysians? Okay, very good. That's excellent, that's a very good step. Uh, but make sure you vote. And we will try through the courts, it's in the courts at the moment, and I think through some kind of encouragement, maybe, uh, David, you should tell us what your plan is, huh? Where's David? Uh, what your plan is for Global Brasil on uh, whether, you know, in the event elections are called and we don't get postal votes through. Uh, we are working on campaigning to get legislation change and uh, postal voting working for all Malaysians, regardless of your occupation whether you're a student or you're working. Um, but if all fails before the next general election, we will lobby, we are, we will lobby airlines, possibly Air Asia, <laughs> give us discounts to fly back to Malaysia to have our vote. Uh, we have started this a few, few weeks ago. One night we had a few people tweeting Tony Fernandez continually. And he said he believes that you can vote from overseas, but if that's not the case, we might work out something. So there is hope. So we will follow, follow through with that. You see, nothing ventured, nothing gained. This is sticking out of the box. So you can all really come up with these ingenious methods. Uh, and that's why Global Bursi is so exciting. Because look at the things you all come up with. It's fantastic. I mean, our brains are outside the country, actually. But they look so good because the ideas are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen at the back. No? Uh, in that case. So I believe there are a lot of um, efforts that we made to um, create awareness for people in Sabah and Sarawak. But what about those Orang Asli's in the peninsula, which are often forgotten? Because um, the term Orang Asli, um, actually, from what I was, um, from what I understand, doesn't really include those in the peninsula of Malaysia. Um, I mean, they are not protected under the, the constitution. Not, yes. Yeah. So um, what is being done to create the awareness or um, of voting among these people or to um, highlight their rights as part of Malaysia, uh, Malaysians. Right? Um, the second question would be, 
Um, I know we are all hyped up that um, hoping that the government is going to make changes prior to the um, coming elections and all. So, um, assuming the worst case scenario, it doesn't happen, they win the election, they impose more um, rules and regulations. So, what's next for Bursi? Okay, uh, I'll take your second question first. We always have to assume the worst. I mean, uh, no doubt about that. I.e., we always have to assume that no, um, you know, uh, reform will take place. Then the answer is, of course, to ensure as many people come out and vote. Uh, but you know, and if the government comes back into power and um, they uh, start imposing unreasonable restrictions then, of course, the people will have to speak again. How they do that is another question altogether. But what I will venture is this. I don't think uh, that any government can afford to make the mistake of ignoring the voices of the people, of ignoring people in this world where we are all you know, uh, uh, connected and where we all share information so that they don't have the monopoly of information. Uh, we are actually empowered by information. It would be a huge mistake. Uh, I'm not saying they may not make that mistake, but it would be a huge mistake to ignore the voices of the people. And I think Bursi will carry on. Bursi will grow from strength to strength. And every time uh, attacks, let me tell you, every time attacks are made on Bursi, uh, we get another thousand followers, okay? So, <laughs> so, you know, and that's where the strength lies. The strength lies in the unity that we must show in the face of oppressive behavior of the government. Uh, Orang Asli, yes, I actually am on the uh, co-chair, and I was chair last year, of the Orang Asli Committee of the Bar Council, so I know exactly what you're saying. Now, the Orang Asli, uh, because there are groups, there are many groups that work with the Orang Asli, they actually, uh, we actually want to empower, want them to be empowered. And that is the aim. The aim is not to, you know, is, is not to help them like a charity, but to show them that they really have uh, uh, substantial rights in our country and that their voices count. And I think there is a movement. We are, they know about voting rights. There is engagement with the Oran Asli on voting rights as well. So, and I'm pleased to say that um, this is, I think, last year, the last year or the year before, there is a legislation that's going to come into force that the government was planning to bring into force, which effectively destroys the ancestral lands of the Orang Asli. If you know the Orang Asli, you know that their ancestral lands are a major part of their life. For them, that is their life. If you take away their land, you take away everything. You take away their culture, everything. So. There's legislation coming that was intended to be passed in relation to taking away that ancestral land without much compensation. That would have destroyed the whole culture of the Orang Asli. 2,000 Orang Asli marched in Putrajaya, and we were so proud of them. They did that themselves. They organized it, and they marched in Putrajaya against that legislation. Unfortunately, many ministers and the minister responsible have a very paternalistic attitude towards the Oran Asli. They think they can't think of themselves. But what we are seeing is a growing empowerment of the Oran Asli in uh, West Malaysia. So I think there are enough people who are with them, actually. As we always said, we will, be, we will stand by them. Um, and I think what we're saying is greater empowerment. My name is Moichi Mang, South America College of Law. Um, you, you mentioned global diversity, and you know, there's another uh, dimension of globalization that I actually wanted to ask you about. And, um, of course, a lot of the concerns and the issues that you're mentioning are very localized and specific to Malaysia, but there's been similar movements um, elsewhere in the region and beyond. So I'm just very curious as to, you know, um, are any of these, you know, um, you know, the folklore about any of these movements, the so-called Arab Spring, or maybe what happened in Pakistan already or in Thailand, uh, it's sort of filtering into the public discourse in Malaysia. And, uh, is that the reason it, it No, I'm saying them? to what extent, if at all. Were we affected by that? Uh, yeah, some of that, you know, the, you know you, you're drawing, the movement is drawing inspiration from events elsewhere. And, uh, okay, uh, let, let, let me say this. We didn't think of any of those movements when we thought of the Bursi rally in 2009 because we had already had a rally 
in 2007, which had about 50,000 people out there as well, but the reaction of the government was not so severe. Uh, so we didn't have in mind the Arab Spring because we were not nowhere, we are nowhere near the situation of the Arab Spring. What the people went through there is completely different. All we were doing was ask, asking for free and fair elections for goodness sakes. We were not there to overthrow anybody. So that didn't enter into our, uh, into our minds. But looking back, that's why I mentioned those things. Looking back, we are really no different from what people in the other parts of the world aspire to. We're no different. We, between elections, we want a way of letting the government know if we don't like the way they're running the government. And that's because we are empowered with information. Uh, that's why uh, Bursi happened. And let me tell you, Bursi happened the way that it did, and it captured the hearts and minds of the people so much simply because of the reaction of the government to us. Had the government said, okay, go ahead, um, you know, and we'll provide the police, it would have been done and over with, and no one would have been at all interested in electoral reform because most Muslims were not interested. But because the government for six weeks literally, you know, uh, uh, demonized per se, I think right thinking people, it struck a chord, right thinking people thought this is not acceptable. And that's why it happened the way that it did. I think we have probably time for one more question. Is there anyone who wants to ask me a question, who doesn't agree with what proceeded? <laughs> it would be good to have a question. Yes, if that was what the opinion poll showed. Although we do have a following, because we know, because uh, of the people who turned up on that day. But clearly, the larger groups that turned up were from the urban areas. I think that was what the survey was about. And yes, we are taking steps to address these issues. We are actually having roadshows. Because our campaign, Clean Before 13, to us is a very important campaign. And we need to take that to as many people as we can. So yes, we are addressing those issues. We actually have, for example, videos work very well in, in Malaysia, in, you know, in many areas. It's easy for people to access, it's easy for people to get information, and they like, uh, it, it's just an easy way of communicating. So in fact, uh, PTO, uh, this is not, uh, not from Bursi, but it, it's something we support strongly, came out with an Undila video. Undila means vote. Uh, it's a brilliant video and very accessible. Everyone can understand it. Basically asking people to register to vote and to go out and vote. But lo and behold, the government banned it. Um, so again, and this is post per se and, and no one can understand to date why it was banned. But of course in Malaysia, when you ban something, it becomes more popular. So everybody, <laughs> everybody went and looked at them. So actually, they do you a favor by banning all these books and uh, all these publications. So, so there, there are efforts, not just by Bursi. Bursi is not the only one. There are eff efforts by many parties, really not to tell people how to vote, because I think that's wrong, and I don't think they do, but to raise the awareness of the importance of voting with Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Maureen Chima from the College of Law just to make some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Well, it's my privilege to uh, give uh, remarks for this uh, public lecture, and I'll be um, as brief as I possibly can. Um, but there's certainly quite a few people to thank. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Department of Political and Social Change for co sponsoring this event, and particularly Professor uh, Edward Espinal for chairing and moderating this session. Um, there were certain people who were instrumental in organizing this talk and um, the people who were most directly um, in touch with me, I, I would like to thank Professor John Funston and George Lopez. Um, and I'm absolutely sure there are quite a few pe other people that I'm not aware of uh, you know, who, were, who were quite instrumental in making this wonderful event happen. Uh, of course, I, you know, um, uh, and then I also have to, uh, I should thank the uh, 
uh, COAST, which is the department at the EMU College of Law, which organized this event uh, and organizes other events at the College of Law. So they, as usual, did a wonderful job. And I thank all of you for turning up, for uh, demonstrating your keen interest in uh, Malaysia and the political developments in that country and for making this a very successful event. And uh, last and of course, most importantly, I, have to, uh, I should thank Dr. Mpiga Srinivasan for coming here and for uh, highlighting these issues, these political developments in Malaysia and for enlightening us about um, all of these issues. Um, I had some experience of a similar movement in Pakistan around the illustration of the judiciary. And, and, and I must point out that if you haven't really seen it or experienced it, you cannot fully appreciate the courage and commitment that it, it requires to uh, uh, to your ideas that it requires to, you know, to, uh, pursue such demands in an authoritarian political system, um, and so I, you know, I really admire uh, that, and you know, and of all your uh, colleagues who were involved in this uh, movement. And um, lastly, I'll very unabashedly uh, market the College of Law very briefly. Uh, there is an increasing interest in the Asia and Pacific region as part of the college's internationalization drive, and we're very much interested in. You know, the issues of rule of law and democratization and uh, law and society more generally in, in the region. So please keep an eye out for further events um, that the College of Law organizes at some stage. So thank you once again. Thank you very much.